God the Creator, and God who is the Vine Dresser, prune our heart and our thoughts here today, that we're able to uh, abide in Him, abide in His Word, and may the Lord prune the things that um, we do not need. So let us take a moment and, and trust that that's the work of God that He'll perform for us today. Okay? Let us extend our uh, faith into prayer and ask God to prune in us the things that we that are detrimental to us. Prune in us habits and thoughts and patterns and sins that do not bear fruit. While the pruning process might be painful at times, but let us trust that the vine dresser knows his craft and let us leave our, surrender our life to him, that we may become fruitful through his word. Let us pray together. that you may take our life and that you prune the things that are diseased, that do not bear fruit, the thoughts and habits which we have, the patterns of life that are detrimental to us. We pray that you will prune those so that we may live and truly live. Help us not to hold on to idolatry Help us not to hold on to the things that uh, hinder us from knowing you. God, we also pray that um, while this may seem painful to us at times to be pruned, uh, I I pray that we will trust your um, love and your skill and your sovereignty and, and We trust that you will do what is good and right and life-giving for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Let's see. I'm going to share the text for you. Actually, I can't share the screen with you. Um, Why don't you just simply go to the link that I provided for you? And there you'll see tonight's text. And what you will notice in that text is that there are three big movements. And I let me just tell you what those are, so that when you read, um, you sort of have a frame of reference, a frame, a mental frame that is already created for you, so that your reading might become more um, fruitful. So one is um, people basically they're people turning away from good God. And there's a reason for that. And I'll let you do the reading and and to figure out what the reasons might be. And as they turn away from God, that's the first movement. The second movement is that God himself will hide his face from his people, that he will not protect them and he will be actively uh, shunning them. And the last movement, and he will bring calamity and also punishment upon them uh, for for their waywardedness uh, because it's a a covenantal, like a marriage relationship. So you have forsaken me, I, I have forsaken you. But the third movement is that, but when you do come back to me, when you come to your senses and you do come back and you realize that their idols are really no gods at all, and they cannot help you in times of calamity. Uh, I will be waiting for you and I will redeem you. So those are three movements. 
uh, the sin and the consequences of sin, and three, redemption from their um, uh, from their sin. So I'll let you read that tonight. And this is oh, what we're reading is really the Moses song, and truncated version of Moses song because the actual song is fairly lengthy. Uh, so I picked out the key points for you. Read it. And as usual, I want you to uh, come up with observations and questions. And we're going to have a discussion around that. Okay, so observation and, and uh, questions. I will give you till 720. Okay. You notice in the text, and let's go with observations first. What are the things that you notice? There's a repetition of the rock. Yeah, very uh, wilderness thing, Palestinian thing. And there's a, there's a deep meaning behind the rock uh, when you speak to Palestinians and, and Jewish people. Okay. Okay, we're going right to the question. I like that, Linda. Who is Jeshurun? Okay, we'll, we'll deal with that. Always on the cutting edge of light evil there, Linda. Yeah, there's a lot of emotions there. That God is not just um, a, like a typewriter that gives out words and commands and instructions. There is an actual lawgiver and, and a person, if you will, with capital P behind these letters. As people grew apart from God, God also gets further away. Ah, whereas people grew closer, grow closer to God, God also takes step towards them. Mm-hmm. Now in this text for sure, that's what he's describing. Uh, God's teaching compared to water in different forms, dew, rain, showers. Yeah. And then we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit about that later. Um, if I forget, just remind me, Daryl. Yeah, I'll, I think I'll take a couple more because, you know, there, there's some stuff that we're, enough stuff that we can talk about. Ah, the last couple verses are worded passive aggressively. Let's see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's uh, <laughs> passive aggressive aggressive, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, gesture grew fat. So whoever this gesture might be, uh, he's, he's growing fat and he's a, he's a stout man. He must be battling COVID as well. Yeah, there's a bit of a mocking tone there for sure.
Which is kind of interesting because um, you wouldn't think that uh, a song like this, song that is written to, well, first of all, God is predicting, prophesying that they will leave him once they get into the promised land and that they experience prosperity. And really, um, if once they eat milk and honey, they will leave God, which is really kind of sad, but that's the truth. Um, and there is not only a tone of anger, but there's, there's mocking and, and there's all these emotions that are coming into this text. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's work with some of the things that you guys wrote. And um, then we will go into, well, you know what? Do you have any other questions about this text? And maybe you can hit it all in, in one shot. Do you have any questions? Are there uh, concepts or words um, or ideas that uh, you want clarified or you want to dive into more? Okay, what is Sheol? Okay. Thank you for that question. It doesn't just have to be textual, but it can be conceptual as well. If you have questions like, um, why why do people why do Israelites leave every time they have their tummies fall? What is the rock? Okay, hey hey, okay. do do you smell what the rock is cooking there, Joel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay um or questions like does actually does god actually get angry just to throw up uh, you know give you some ideas about the th questions that you can ask okay i'll let you think about those questions um you know, the weird, sometimes, you know, just weird questions are really good. Like, is there such thing as other gods? Anyway, here we go. The rock is brought up several times. And the question at the bottom, uh, what is the rock? So what do you guys think? Why do you think rock is significant in this text? Uh, keep, uh, where is it? Hmm, verse four, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his, uh, for all his ways are just. Now, what is this rock? What do you think this rock is mentioned? Why, why does uh, a rock, uh, God is attributed to being like a, a, like a rock? Oh, oh, thank you, Mac, highlighting all the rocks. <laughs> You rock, Mac. Mm -hmm. And I think verse 15 over here, let me make it all fancy. Yep. And scoff at the rock of his salvation. I think that may give you uh, some hints and clues as to how rock, why uh, God is being compared to a rock, especially in the wilderness. And verse 37, Matt, this is awesome. Verse 37 and verse 615 will give you some clues. Not a particular mountain, although mountain is significant, uh, like Mount Sinai or Horeb or Carmichael. Or... But this is not necessarily um, a particular mountain, but is speaking of the rock. Like...
Reference to foundation for sure. Yeah, that can be one of them. That and, and you know, possibly verse four can be that, right? The rock his work is perfect, for all his ways are just. If the foundation is right, if foundation is leveled and solid, everything goes on top of it has a chance. So there's definitely that kind of uh, foundation. Don't build your house on a sandy land kind of idea. Is there a historical uh, cultural reference for a rock for the Israelites? Yeah, um, very much so. Like rock is seen as a salvation and rock is seen as a place where you take refuge. And it's, it's sort of hard to know unless you know the geography of the, uh, of the place. Uh, and I've, I've not been to Israel, but you know, I cheated and I looked at pictures and videos. So <laughs> yes, caves, only natural protection in the desert. And then, oh, two people came up with the same answer. Yeah, when, when David ran away, um, where was he hiding? He was hiding in the caves because caves are numerous. And if you watch Indiana Jones part three, and we'll pretend part four didn't happen. Um, you know, there's the city Petra, where a, a castle or a refuge is carved out literally from a face of the rock. So, you know, there, there are thousands of caves. Um, okay, I'm exaggerating, but there's about probably thousand at least, not thousands. And if you go into one of them, imagine like, you know, unlimited amount of beehives in each hole. You hide in one of those holes and it will take somebody a lifetime to find you because there are just that many caves and you are hiding under the rock and that's where you take refuge. And God is that. Yay, I'm so glad you guys came up with that. And I, I wasn't sure if you would come to that conclusion because it, it takes a cultural understanding. Okay, so that is why uh, the rock is brought up. And, and let's, let's kind of hit it a little further, hit the ball a little further up the field. So then what is God? Who is God? What, what has God done for them in the desert? And that's easily, that's something you can think about, that God is the rock for these people. And if he is the rock then, can he be the rock for you now? And do you take refuge in him? Does he provide you with shelter? Does he provide you with cool, um, uh, the shade from the harshness of the desert? And is, is, there, is it like a, once you go in, like, you know they're not going to find you? I mean, that's how they felt. The security of hiding, if you're hiding in one of those caverns, uh, the chances of you found is nil. Um, a little bit of a side story. The Red Sea, yeah, the Red Sea squir squirrel, scroll was found in one of these tiny caverns by a shepherd boy who figured that one of these caves will have treasure buried in them. So every day when he went out, he would visit one or two and, and eventually he landed on this well-preserved um, manuscript of the Old Testament. Okay, now going back up, uh, let's look at Jeshurun, Jeshurun. I think it's how it's pronounced. Um, what is, you know, I think I just have to give you the definition because there's no way you would know unless you get a help from a dictionary or a commentary. Jeshurun is capitalized and you would think it's a guy, uh, but it, 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 it isn't. It's, um, uh, how do you say it? Um, upright person, a righteous person. So uh, Jeshurun is capitalized to say that Israelites were good and upright, you know, because he is, they are from the rock. His work is perfect and all his ways are just. And verse 18, you are unmindful of the rock that bore you. So God is the one that bore you, that you came out of that rock. So naturally the offspring of salvific rock is that you would get an upright person. So Jeshurun is an upright person, but notice what happened to him. 
he grew fat and, and kicked. And I, I guess kicking is, well, you can guess as to what that is. Uh, and you can share your thoughts if you want. And he grew fat, and, fat, stout, and sleek. So what is wrong with that? What is wrong? What are they describing here? Uh, an upright person, uh, Jeshrin, grew fat and kicked, and you grew fat, stout, and sleek. What kind of spiritual condition is um, Moses describing? Oh, okay. Never, ever, ever thought of that. Spiritually undisciplined. Yeah, sort of like uh, me and ice cream right now, right? Three times a day. Stop exercise. I like this one too. They stopped exercising their faith. Yeah, and, and, and they are holding on. They're, they're gra gravitating towards something else. Okay. Oh, shoot. I, I, I didn't look that word up um, because I, I just answered it in my head. What, what does the word sleek mean? Um, let me get back to you on uh, the, the actual Hebrew definition. Uh, I, I just assume that, you know, when you eat well, that you're kind of like um, free stop. Like there's a, you're, you're like a, well-fed butcher there's a sheen to you and there's like a rosiness to you and, and there's like that little i don't know like gloss like that korean k k k drama makeup gloss you know so they're they're fat and they're stout and they got that sheen happening and and that's where that's the state they're in I think there's a lot of interesting meditation here, guys. So uh, take your time. And, and take notice of the repetition and, um, you know, what each word may mean. Like what does kicking mean? Like kicked. Like grew fat and kicked. So it's sort of a interesting description there. Guys are awfully quiet. Okay, well, I please do continue to think about it. It's interesting that uh, Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, <laughs> stout and sleek. So focus seems to be on the word, um, on the phrase grew fat. And, um, what does that really mean? And kick their legs up to be fat and rest? Kick their legs up to be fat? Oh, like kicking your legs back or kind of thing. Yeah. They got comfortable where they were and kicked. Yeah, I wonder if it, I, I think that might be um, sort of a modern interpretation of the word kicked. And I, I, I should have done a deeper study of the word kicked. But again, I, I meditated it on as a, a sort of a mule kicking, that they grew fat and, and became rebellious, unruly. 
but but that's sort of my um, non scholarly John Kim's meditation. But uh, yeah, again, uh, let's think about the word, the phrase is grew fat. Um, what is that a big concern? Because when God, uh, what is the promised land? What is promised in the promised land? Yes, enjoying fruit of the land, but forgot who brought them there. Yeah, so they got in and they loved the gift. They loved milk and honey. And they grew fat. And that is repeated twice. So these people are now no longer in control of their blessing. And they're after the blessing, just in the same way that, you know, capitalism has its merit, but also we are seeing the, the extreme downside of capitalism. I mean, capitalism builds schools and then roads and hospitals and stuff like that. But anyway, so it just got out of hand. Ah, he says, for Sukkah, rejected the rock of his salvation. Thank you. Yeah, so they became like rebellious, like a donkey kicking, uh, I suppose. And you know what? Yeah, uh, being fat was seen as privilege of the wealthy. Uh, you know, I don't know if they had that kind of European mentality, but we know for sure that nomadic people, as Israelites were, um, not having enough food and not having steady source of food to having steady uh, uh, transitioning to agrarian culture, uh, I'm sure it has some sort of, um, it did a number on them and they became stout and sleek. Yeah, the, the word sleek is sort of, um, I guess, even like favorable, like they're, they're fat, but they're sleek. So they, yeah, there might be, I don't know, Sorry, that's a long explanation. But they, they did enjoy their privilege. And of course, food is associated in, in the Old Testament as something that's a blessing to the person and something that you bless other people with and something that you left on the field. Like when you gather your sheaves, your grains, you leave some in the corners on purpose so that strangers and sojourners can come and gather those or orphans and widows, they can gather those and go. So the fact, the fact that they're getting fat uh, reveals their spiritual condition of what they're doing with their wealth, okay? Um, I, we dwell on this a little bit longer than I anticipated, but thank you so much for your uh, comments. So what do you guys think of the fact? I, I think what I'm gonna leave you with tonight is what do you think of, about the fact that people all through the desert journey that from beginning to the end and on the other side of Jordan, that people are leaving God because of food. Okay. So we talked about the significance of food and, you know, gaining weight and all that stuff here. But then I want you to think about the very fact that um, the like number of times that Israelites wanted to go back to Egypt because they like the food there. The number of times that they, oh, I bit my tongue. They try to kill Moses because there was enough food. And the number of times they complain to God because they're sick and tired of manna and quail. And, then, and now that God is saying, when you go into the promised land and tasted milk and honey and you grow fat, you will abandon me. So I, I think, I, I want you guys to um, think about how is that relevant to me? Um, not just in a sense of like, oh man, I'm silly. Like if I abandon the rock for food, that's really silly. But at the same time, there might be something like that in your life. And, and there might be some places where when you grow fat, quote unquote, uh, that you will kick, you will kick. And maybe there's a part of you that is really chasing after uh milk and honey of life and that God is only being used and, and, and deployed to get you there and make, make sure that you feel safe until you get to that point. I don't know. You, you have to um, do some deep digging and, and be honest. And, and two, so I want you to figure out in what area uh, are you really giving up God 
over silly things, over food. And, and, and secondly, oh shoot, I forgot. This is what happens guys when you don't write it down. Anyway, yeah, I want you to um, think about that and the rest of the verses, uh, rest of Moses' song, which says that the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants uh, when he sees that their power is gone and there's none remaining bond or free. Then he will say, where are their gods, their rock in which they took refuge? Who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank wine from their drinking offering? And, and Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So God will wait for us, but as we live for food, it will incite His anger. God is not pink and fluffy, and He's not wearing a um, fluffy costume. He is God, and anyone who enters into covenant relationship with Him and turns away because of food, He calls that break of relationship and adultery. He is every bit as upset and angry as a husband or wife whose spice, uh, spouse have cheated on them. So uh, you will incite his wrath, but at the same time, when you return to him, he will receive you again and he will vindicate you and vindicate us. Okay, let's pray. Father God, we pray that you will trim us, you will prune us, You'll cut the places, so trim the fat in our life. The food that was supposed to be shared and seen as a blessing have now become priority and is entering into the body in an excessive force, in an excessive pace, an excessive desire that they're growing fat. The righteous is growing fat. It's not evil, dumb-witted, um, you know, idiots but it's saying the upright. It's not the foolish, but the upright who is growing fat and fat. God, I pray that none of us here will think that we are um, um, exempt from this temptation. And we thank you for Christ who has forgiven us of our sins. And this is a reminder that we are not saved alone that we are only thing we can do is to admit that we have, we cannot trim ourselves. We cannot prune ourselves just in the same way that tree cannot. So God, we come to you and we cry out to you and say, only you can save us. Only you can trim and, and prune us and show us the right way of living. So God, I pray that we will look into the mundane areas of our life to see if we are honoring you with material goods, even the food that we eat. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.